we, we usually start every cafe with a mindfulness exercise to bring us into the room. However, Chantal has got something planned as part of talking about this very important topic. Um, and she'll position why we're going to do a bit of a vagal nerve mindfulness ex exercise. And if you don't know what the vagal nerve is, that's okay. You'll know all you need to know by 10 to 2. And okay, awesome. Yeah, so Chantal, over to you. I'm not going to do a grand intro. Chantal is one, a dear friend, one of the first people that I worked for in the well-being space when I was in South Africa still. She headed up well-being at Vodacom. And uh, I know that Sharon and myself did a lot of exciting work with Chantel. And Sh Chantel, you've just been a leader, a beacon of inspiration. You are like a lighthouse in terms of well-being. It's my oh, honor thanks to introduce you. Thanks. So over to you. And I know you've got some slides to share. And there'll be time for questions. After I think you, you're going to chat for about 25 minutes or so. And then we'll yeah. have time for questions. And yeah. this is part one of part two. So if yeah. some of your questions relate to next week or part two, I think it may be good then to keep that for next week but you'll guide us on that Chantel. Great so um, hi everybody um, let's get straight into it so we're going to start where you're going to put one hand on your belly and the other hand on your chest and you're going to take a few comfortable breaths no mouth breathing only through your nose in and out through your nose and however many times you choose to do it just draw attention to which hand moves more, the hand on your chest or the hand on your belly. And just as you rated yourself out of 10 on the chat, that maybe you also just want to enter into the chat, um, whether you are a belly breather or a chest breather. And we'll chat about that um, later. So maybe just a minute so everyone can start to do that. Okay, so now if you will take two fingers, the middle finger and the index finger of maybe your right hand and find your pulse on your left wrist. So if you know how to do that, it's two centimeters from the base of your wrist and you'll find your pulse. And then I want you just to close your eyes and... Um, I just want to set a stopwatch. You're going to close your eyes. You're going to continue to breathe in a relaxed manner through in and out through your nose. And I want you to count um, your heartbeat for the next 30 seconds. And then just make a note of it. If you want to enter it into the chat, you can, but it's more for your own context. So we're going to start in three, two, one, count. and stop. So both of those um, exercises that we just did, and I'm going to actually start the slide. We'll put the first slide um, on here. Celine, you'll tell me if I have it right. Sure. Um, okay. Yeah, it's Okay, I'm going to start at that slide. Is that good? Good. Okay, so um, the vagus nerve is part of the parasympathetic nervous system. So in the very stressful lives that we all live, we tend to be in what we refer to as sympathetic dominance. So our autonomic nervous system, which is that nervous system in the body that 
controls all the things that we don't think about digestion, breathing, heartbeat, et cetera, et cetera. It's always in a balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is related to fight and flight and the parasympathetic nervous system is related to rest and restoration. So our bodies always need to be moving fluidly between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. So what we're finding is that many, many people sit in what we refer to as sympathetic dominance. So you never go into your parasympathetic nervous system out our bodies stay overstimulated and they're all of the things that go with that metabolic syndrome, chronic fatigue, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we describe sympathetic dominance as driving your car at 120 Ks an hour on the highway in first gear. And if you had a fifth or a sixth gear, that would be the parasympathetic nervous system where the body's in a much more rested and relaxed state. So parasympathetic nervous system is the vagus nerve. So for those of you who found that you were chest breathers, it's an indication that your vagus nerve is understimulated and that your parasympathetic nervous system is not as effective as it could should be. And also if you had what we would refer to as a resting heart rate, although we didn't spend a lot of time breathing, it should have brought us into more of a restful state. And if your heart rate was above 65 odd for the minute, so that was the 30 seconds that we did obviously times by two, if your heart rate was above 65, then you are also still in sympathetic with an understimulated vagus nerve. So we're just really talking about the importance of the vagus nerve because it is fundamental to what we're going to share about um, the gut microbiome. So um, I've been in the healthcare industry for 25 years and it was only in 2016 that I actually understood the importance of the gut microbiome and also what exactly leaky gut meant. So um, Hippocrates, the Greek philosopher and the father of medicine in 2400 BC, he said all disease begins in the gut. BC, BC people, BC. So what happened in all that time that having been in the health and wellness industry, I only learned about the diseases associated with improper gut health in 2016. And so um, let's talk about that um, history. So I think you will agree that we are a world that's obsessed with thin and fit, meaning that if we see somebody who participates in regular exercise, we assume they're healthy. If we see somebody who's thin, we assume that they're healthy. And we know that the chronic diseases of lifestyle, which include high blood pressure, high cholesterol, abnormal sugar, are known as the silent killers because there are no, not necessarily obvious outward symptoms that there's something going on. So if you look like I'm lugging it, it's pretty obvious that um, there might be underlying conditions. But in most cases, we would assume that if a person is either thin or participates in regular exercise, that they are healthy. And so we need actually to go one step deeper because we all know the story of the horrific stories of the athletes who drop dead during an event, whether it's comrades, whether it's the Cape Argus, I don't know what happens in the UK or in Canada where the others are from, but um, we know that that happens and people will say, how on earth did that happen? Because so-and-so is so healthy and they, they ate well and they exercised all the time. And it is because we actually, A, don't know that they are the silent killers or B, that there is an issue with the gut microbiome. And it has never been as relevant as it is now because we know that to get COVID-19 in a healthy state will just mean you have a virus and you won't necessarily even have symptoms. But if you have an underlying condition, that's when COVID-19 can result in really serious um, illnesses. So what you, is, yes. Do you want to play from the slide so that you have the animations? Because then you can play from current slide, the second from the left on your screen. 
No, it's, I, I actually am. Oh, am I not? There Sorry, you go. Celine. Oh, there we go. Sorry, yeah. thank you for that. Okay, so what is the microbiome? So a microbiome is described as a collection of bacteria, fungus, and parasites that add value to the host. So I know that sounds like a complete contradiction because we understand a parasite as being something like a tick that would suck blood from the host and ultimately kill it. But um, the microbiome is described as that. And we tend to just limit it to healthy gut bacteria. We don't actually say, yes, it's also um, beneficial parasites, viruses, and um, we, we just really say it's bacteria, but just to know that it is all of them and they add value to the host. So the, um, the studying and the research and the documentation and the understanding of the gut microbiome is still very new, but it has been labeled the new frontier in health. Um, it's been around for the last 10 to 15 years. And the more they study it, and all the major universities in the world have dedicated um, departments that are looking into the gut microbiome. And so the more information that comes out, the more is understood about it. And what we know now is that an unhealthy gut microbiome is, li is linked to many of the current diseases affecting the world. Um, and that includes obesity, autoimmune conditions. And the autoimmune conditions include rheumatoid arthritis, um, Oh, my mind's just gone blank. Rheumatoid arthritis um, and uh, asthma is another one. Type 2 diabetes is another one. All of those are autoimmune conditions. Uh, Hashimoto's, thyroid, um, cancer, depression, ADHD, and autism. So a very strong connection between um, autism and a dysbiosis of the gut microbiome, which we'll um, talk more about shortly. Okay, so we are more bacteria than we are human cells. So this image is showing you that we have four microbiomes. We have a microbiome in our mouth, we have a microbiome on our skin, uh, in our urogenital tract, and then the biggest microbiome is in the digestive tract. And it is understood that the digestive tract is actually the motherboard. So if the microbiome of the digestive tract goes out, so that means that those bacteria, the healthy bacteria, either reduce in volume or reduce in diversity, it has a direct impact onto the other three microbiomes. So for example, a person who has recurrent urinary tract infections, you know for sure that their gut microbiome is not healthy. A person who has psoriasis or eczema, the same thing, you'll know that the digestive tract microbiome is out when there are um, skin conditions. Mouth ulcers, the same would go for that. So this is the digestive tract, which you would imagine is like a creepy crawly pipe that extends from your mouth into your esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and then out. And all of these little bacteria are supposed to look friendly because they exactly are. Our gut microbiome is healthy, good bacteria. And what you're seeing in all the colors is a graphic representation of the number the variety of them. So it is like having a big organization where there would be lots of divisions. You can't have too many people in one division and none in the other. So the two things that you want to remember about the gut microbiome is that one, there needs to be volume. So there are trillions and trillions and trillions of gut bacteria. And the second point is that there has to be diversity. So there needs to be um, the right balance of purple to green to light blue to brown to orange to pink. And if any of them are destroyed, we know that they, that is related to a specific condition, which we'll also go into more detail in a bit. Okay, so Celine, um, in the introduction to this session, wrote some, some interesting facts about the gut microbiome. So we'll talk a bit more about it, is that our gut microbiome or the, the microbes, um, the, the microbiomes in our entire body, but specifically in the gut, because that makes up 90% of our microbiome, our body's microbiome, they outnumber our human cells 10 to 1. So actually, we are more bacteria 
then we are human cells. And Celine also mentioned that they have genes, they have RNA and DNA, and our microbes communicate with our human cells. So you probably all know about the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the human cell. And um, people who suffer chronic fatigue, they'll often say your mitochondrial energy is down. And you can actually get mitochondrial specialists who focus on increasing the, the energy or the powerhouse production of the mitochondria. So what they know now is that the mitochondria are also made up of bacteria, which is interesting. So the gut hosts 100 billion bacteria for every gram of matter. That would be in the large intestine. So through the digestive tract, which goes mouth, esophagus, stomach, large, small intestine, large intestine out, you'll get some bacteria, some microbiome in the small intestine, but the majority are in the large intestine. So that's 100 billion in per one gram would relate to your large intestine. Okay, they contribute genes to us. And then where do we get as to whether a baby's microbiome begins, develops at once it's born or it's actually through the birthing process. So um, as, a, as a baby passes through the birth canal, that's in fact where the microbiome is. So cesarean babies and babies who are put onto formula or nasogastric feeding um, very early because they're in ICU are bo born prem, they often have compromised immune systems because their, their gut microbiome is not seeded correctly. So in, in more forward-thinking OBSIN gynae facilities, the babies with fluid from the birth canal because it's such an important part of seeding the microbiome and uh, there are gut bacteria both in the breast milk but also okay so so having a closer look I've been talking about what is into the um, stomach so, so there are not um, gut bacteria in the stomach because it's too i can hear you sharon now chantelle you're going in and out and i'm wondering if you switched your camera off if we could get a better signal because you're coming in and out we're losing your voice every second sentence oh i think it might be a bit of bandwidth issue um how do i just go to the bottom left where it says stop video bottom left of your screen bottom left of my screen just wiggle the cursor around and you see, see a button that says stop video. Stop the... Yeah, got it. Okay, perfect. So Thanks. you'll just give me a, ha a heads up if... Uh... Yeah, it seems good Sorry, now. now I've lost... I've lost my... Okay, I got my slides back. Um, okay, so we've spoken mouth, esophagus, the look. This would be if we cut a cross section of the large intestine. So this would really be what we refer to as the creepy crawly pipe. So even though that looks quite thick, this is, this is a very, very um, microscopic view and intensified um, um, picture of it. But that layer is actually only one cell layer thick. And we know that the wall of the gastrointestinal tract have what we call villi, which you can see on that image, which increase the surface area. So your intestines, if they were spread out, would actually cover four tennis courts. And it's because of the convoluted shape of our gastrointestinal tract that the absorptive um, surface is increased. So the digestive tract has one function. And that is to extract and absorb micronutrients from food. So our cells in our body are reliant on micronutrient sufficiency. So the micronutrients are the vitamins and all the minerals. So we know all the minerals like calcium, magnesium, um, everybody has those kind of supplements. 
elements in their cupboard. We often don't think about boron, solybdenum, copper, et cetera, et cetera. So there are 20, 22 different micronutrients that our body requires. And a micronutrient deficiency will show up um, um, in a, over a period of time. So it's quite similar to if you hit a pothole the wearing on your tire would only become apparent in two to three years. So people can live with micronutrient deficiencies which show up in an illness or a disease process many years down the line. But we know that everything can be traced back to a micronutrient deficiency, every illness and disease. So there are two ways that you can get that. One is that you don't provide your body with a wide enough variety of food in order to get that micronutrient. And that's often cultural or families. Um, where people tend to eat from certain food groups. And the other would be if your gut microbiome is compromised um, or your gut surface is compromised, you would not be able to extract, uh, if, if effectively extract the micronutrients from the food. So this is a very important slide. I want to just go back to this one. So that creepy crawly pipe, the black in the middle is what we call the lumen. That is where the food would be passing through. So, so please just keep this image in your mind when you look back at this cell. So this, at this slide, this is going from the inside out. So where you see gut lumen, they're marked. So all those little worm-like things are our gastrointestinal bacteria, our gut microbiome. Okay, then one of the functions of our gut microbiome is to produce mucus. And the mucus layer actually protects what you see as the epithelial cell. So if I go back to this slide, that wall of that gastrointestinal tract looks quite thick, but actually it's because it's convoluted. You, you actually have a single layer of cells called the epithelial cells that form the wall of the digestive tract. So what's important, come in, Vincent. What's important, sorry, I'm just going to move. Um, just call Vincent. <laughs> sorry, everyone, can you hear me still? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so the, the epithelial cell layer is a single cell layer, and that is very important because the micronutrients in the food are tiny. So if there was more than one cell layer, you would lose micronutrients in the absorption process. So nature was very clever to give us one cell layer to facilitate absorption. So right on the other side of the epithelial cells, you can see the immune system, and then you can see the bloodstream. So if we go back to that previous slide, no, and I've gone the, totally the wrong way. Um, uh, I'm not winning here. Yeah, there we go. Um, if we go back to this slide, um, yeah, sorry, I, I, I totally lost my, my train. The, the single nutrients that need to come through the epithelium. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, so um, surrounding that creepy crawly pipe would be a rich supply of blood vessels. So going back to this, where you see the bloodstream on that side, that creepy crawly pipe would be surrounded by those blood vessels. So um, if we go from the inside out, food would pass through the lumen. Um, it would be broken down by the gut bacteria and the gut bacteria would absorb the micronutrients through the single cell layer, which would then be absorbed into the bloodstream and carried to the rest of the body where those micronutrients would be used in the cells. So that is the primary function of the digestive tract. And those gut bacteria play a very important role in breaking down the food and absorbing the micronutrients from the food in order that they can be absorbed by the epithelial cells. So if you look at the junction between those epithelial cells, what looks like equal signs, those are what we call tight junctions. So those epithelial cells need to be on top of one another, forming a filter so micronutrients are tiny and can be absorbed through the epithelial cell into the bloodstream where they will be carried to the rest of the body. Other toxins that you might bring into your body through drinking not so clean water or eating not so clean food, 
um, they would be filtered out because of what we refer to as the tight junctions between the epithelial cells. So this is a very important slide to understand. We also know that 70% of the gut is, 70% of our immune system is in our gut. And you can see the immune system there sitting between the epithelial cells and the bloodstream. But this is a graphic representation. Um, it doesn't look like that in reality because the immune system is not a system, it's cells. So your leukophages, your, your, your leukocytes, your macrophages, all of those um, white blood cells that are important in immunity and the hormones are intertwined between the epithelial cells and the blood vessels. Okay, so... Um, if we go on to these two slides, this is important. So looking again at this slide, those tight junctions can be broken apart. And when those tight junctions break apart, where you see the green arrow going through there, that is actually leaky gut. So leaky gut is a hyperpermeable gut wall, meaning that toxins that would normally be filtered by the tight junctions can now pass through and get into the blood vessels. So if I go back to this slide, um, what you might consider is that in the large intestine, the gut lumen is poop. So your epithelial cells and that mucus protective layer that is produced by the gut microbiome is the only separation between poop and blood vessels. So you would understand that if you get leaky gut, that many toxins that should actually be eliminated from the body are now able to be absorbed into the bloodstream and that sets up low grade inflammation. So you can get leaky gut in two ways and I'm gonna go back to this slide. If you lose gut bacteria from the gut lumen, so they are not all the variety that they should be, and they are, there is not as much volume of gut bacteria as they should be. The, the protective layer becomes diminished, and that will cause leaky gut because undigested food particles can actually bump against the epithelial cells and break the tight junctions open, resulting then in leaky gut. The other thing that can cause leaky gut is gluten. So gluten is a protein, and in the 1970s, they genetically modified wheat to form a dwarf wheat, which grows very quickly and can be harvested quickly. And that genetically modified form of gluten, for some reason, binds onto the epithelial cells when we eat it and immediately causes a gap junction. So gluten produces leaky gut. That's why people will say, I suffer from cramping, from bloating, from oscillating between uh, constipation and diarrhea. Um, even skin breakouts are associated with gluten. So on the slide on the right-hand side, you can see the progression of um, leaky gut, that it causes inflammation, gastrointestinal inflammation, which then causes systemic inflammation. So actually the gluten particles themselves are then able to pass through where they normally would be excreted. They are now able to pass through into the blood vessels. And that's actually the origin of autoimmune diseases. And autoimmune disease is where the body attacks its own protein. And because it has an allergic reaction to gluten, it doesn't then learn how to differentiate between the protein in the gluten and the protein in the muscle cells, for example, if in rheumatoid arthritis and asthma is um, uh, similar where it's affecting the lung tissue, thyroid, um, etc. And then also Crohn's disease is obviously destruction of the actual gastrointestinal wall. So um, all diseases are based in inflammation and the inflammation begins with the gut. So um, the, the parasympathetic nervous system and the vagus nerve actually produce acetylcholine and they, that limits the inflammatory response in the bowel. 
So generally, we would tend to eat foods or expose ourselves to lifestyle factors that would cause inflammation in the gut. And it is a stimulation of the vagus nerve or normal functioning of the vagus nerve through the hormone acetylcholine that would limit that inflammation. But if you are in sympathetic dominance, which is how stress produces leaky gut. So... Um, We'll keep referring back to this slide. I want to just touch on to this one because I know time is running out. It seems like we've hardly got started. Um, so primary function of our gut microbiome is immunity. So it does immunity through two ways. One is that the gut bacteria um, actually form a barrier in the gut. They produce the mucus layer, which then protects the epithelial cells, but also they produce the hormones that make white blood cells. So a lot around immunity. Then um, your gut bacteria produce vitamin B as well as vitamin K, and that they are imperative for the absorption of calcium and iron. So when women are experiencing osteoporosis or osteopenia or anemia, it can often be traced back to um, poor gut bacteria and the subsequent poor absorption of calcium and iron. Then metabolism is the fact, metabolism is the breakdown of food and the absorption of micronutrients. So your gut bacteria are absolutely fundamental in that. So we talked about all the various types of um, um, gut bacteria. And um, the two hormones, leptin and ghrelin, that control satiety and hunger, those hormones are produced by your gut bacteria. So if you took a dose of antibiotics that killed the purple gut bacteria in your gut, and those gut bacteria were responsible for producing ghrelin, as an example, you would um, have an issue with satiety where you just never feel hungry. You continue to eat and eat and eat. So they've done studies on the gut bacteria of overweight people and found that they are distinctly different from those people who are within normal weight. And microbiome transplants are being done where they take the microbiome from a normal weight person, transfer it into an overweight person. And the, the person who is overweight becomes normal weight without changing anything in their food or in their exercise pattern. Okay, we've talked about inflammation. Um, and the relationship of gut bacteria to controlling inflammation, especially through the vagus nerve. And then we chatted also about autism. So there's decreased bacterial diversity. So they are, they are now through the research able to say, when you are missing the blue bacteria, you tend to get autoimmune diseases. When you're missing the purple bacteria, you get autism. So in South Africa, we do not have sufficient laboratory services to be able to do what they refer to as poop in the post, which happens in the UK and in America, where they can analyze your gut microbiome and actually um, diagnose which types of gut bacteria are missing. So we do a bit of shot in the dark where we take probiotics that could be any kind of strain of gut bacteria and we just hope that it replaces um, one of the missing varieties that, that uh, might have gone amiss in our, in our gut. Um, I think, Chantal, if you could show the next slide, because I know that that I would like everyone on the call to reflect on in the last week, how many yes. things on this slide have you, yes. been, and perhaps not even the last week, let's say the last year, have you been exposed to? Because all these things negatively impact the gut okay, microbiome. So, so we've known for years and years and years the impact of antibiotics on our gut bacteria. So a doctor will always give you probiotics. So probiotics is the same word as your healthy gut bacteria or your gut microbiome. So when you take probiotics, you are restoring the varieties of natural gut bacteria. So antibiotics are in red meat, they're in chicken, they're in fish. If you buy your fish from Woolies, you'll see on the label that it's either wild, caught or farmed. So any form of farmed fish has got antibiotics. Um, free range does not mean antibiotic free. And we know in factory farming that antibiotics are actually used as growth hormone 
Um, and actually, even humans who um, have found it difficult to control their weight can often trace back their weight gain to a time when they took antibiotics. And that could be because the doctor never prescribed probiotics or never prescribed sufficient probiotics. So generally, if you go on an antibiotic, a doctor will give you if you do five days antibiotics, you get five days probiotics, but actually it takes your gut bacteria six months to recover from one dose of antibiotic. And those of us who are big uh, meat or chicken or farmed fish eaters are taking in antibiotics on a daily basis and not necessarily replacing the gut bacteria with uh, probiotics. So sugar, high sugar diets destroy your gut bacteria, and that's the hidden sugars, the refined sugars, not the, the, not the natural sugars in fruit, but the refined sugars in bread, pasta, cereals. Um, artificial sweeteners, toxic, toxic, toxic. Emulsifiers are thickening agents, so you'll see if you buy any processed food, so meaning prepackaged food, how many emulsifiers and stabilizers are um, in there. So gluten we've mentioned, that gluten destroys the gut bacteria, but also directly causes leaky gut, breaking those tight junctions in the epithelial cells and allowing toxins to move from the gut into the bloodstream, setting up inflammation in the body and um, often associated with autoimmune conditions. Hydrogenated fat are any of your vegetable oils, canola, sunflower, trans fats, um, which you also find in packets of crisps and pre-baked goodies. Um, alcohol, unfortunately, is on this list. So um, you know that we all sanitizing now to get rid of the bacteria and viruses on our skin. So alcohol does exactly the same to your gastrointestinal tract. When you drink, you flush the healthy bacteria out. And actually, many people with chronic conditions can again trace it back to their varsity days where they were not sober for many consecutive days of the week or month or year. Um, unfiltered tap water is because of glyphosate. So the UK um, or Europe are particularly strict with um, additives, flavorants, colorants, preservatives that go into food and also the use of glyphosate. So glyphosate is also known as Roundup. It's used extensively in the farming industry. In South Africa, it's also used to spray parks um, and sidewalks for weeds. And actually dogs um, of all the mammals have the highest incidence of cancer. And it's because they walk on the grass and the glyphosate is absorbed through their pores. So glyphosate is highly, highly water soluble, appearing in parts per million. And if you don't use a carbon filter on your water, you are taking in amounts of glyphosate, which destroy your gut bacteria. So if anybody wants to know more about glyphosate, Dr. Zach Bush, who's um, an American and is leading the world in the studies in glyphosate, um, Monsanto makes glyphosate and they just lost a $2 million court case to one of the employees who proved that his cancer came from um, the use of glyphosate. And then toxins and pesticides, it's the same thing. It's not only glyphosate, it's anything that's sprayed. And um, the, the whole thing of organic is about preventing those excessive pesticides from entering our bodies. Um, additives, flavorants, colorants, preservatives, we know that. Polystyrene and plastic, so BPAs in plastic, um, have that same effect on our gastrointestinal tract. Um, parasitic infections, so you took your pulse at the beginning of the session. So it is said that um, the way to detect whether you have a parasitic infection is to check for a pulse. And if you have a pulse, you have a parasite infection. So anybody who eats sushi or who has pets, you need to do a herbal parasitic detox twice a year because the parasites live in our gastrointestinal tract. They're airborne. They're very easily transmitted um, between organisms or animals and humans, and they disrupt the gut microbiome, which will eventually lead to leaky gut. And then insufficient dietary fiber. So a lot of people, people don't understand what a prebiotic is. So prebiotic is fiber and our gastrointestinal bacteria require fiber in order to survive. It's actually what they eat. And it's at this point actually that we're going to stop part one because we'll go into more detail about 
um, the importance of fiber and how they sustain our gut microbiome. But it's just important to know today that probiotics are your gut bacteria, replacing your healthy gut bacteria, and that prebiotics are dietary fiber. And yes, I think that's a good place to stop. So if anybody has um, any questions, can you stop sharing your slides, Chantal? And then we I'm can gonna take up. them off. Absolutely. And thank you so much. Thank you. Good. Such a pleasure. That was, that was super interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I think you can understand why we had to do this in two parts. Chantal was like, because with, with a strong enough why, you'll always find a how. Even me, I'm like, I know all this stuff. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this creepy crawly, this gut is so intricate. Like, it's incredible what it does. Um, I mean, it's not called our second brain for nothing. And, and Chantel, like you hardly even covered how important serotonin and dopamine are. Yeah. And yeah, so thank you. So I know next week you'll go into a lot more detail around actual food stuffs. But is, has anybody got any questions based on what Chantal has just shared? Brian. What about homemade kimchi? Does that help restore some of the gut? So, um, Brian, that's a great question. And we're going to talk about it in part two. But to answer your question, it's an absolute yes, because fermented foods are natural probiotics. So um, okay. just, to, just to contextualize this is that um, talking about gut health today came up from last week's Resilience Cafe where serotonin was... Um, mentioned and serotonin is produced by the gut bacteria so if you have an imbalance of your gut bacteria or leaky gut you don't produce serotonin and at night serotonin is converted to melatonin which is our rest and repair hormone so without serotonin there's all the anxiety the depression etc and then all the sleep disturbances if you if you are not converting to melatonin so um, fermented foods are a natural source of probiotics. So it's also exploded around the world and we need to be aware of the quality of fermented foods because kombucha, for example, has gone crazy and it needs to be made from the original SCOBY um, in order to have the right amount of bacteria that would form a probiotic because a synthetic kombucha will not be a probiotic. Yeah. And, and I just want to share, if you have serious psoriasis or autism or like my mother who had constipation for 60 years and had to manage her skin, there's no way she could eat kilograms of kimchi and it wouldn't have rectified her gut. She needed a course of probiotics and then to eat the prebiotics to feed the, the bacteria. Because So I feel like it's important to take a good probiotic if you're really trying to get a clinical outcome. So... so um between today and next week, um, what everybody can do is to measure their transit time. So you'll know from your chest versus your belly, belly breathing whether you have got a sympathetic dominance or whether your vagus nerve is functioning effectively. So the vagus nerve being a big part of correct functioning of your abdomen. Of your abdomen. Um, the other was your pulse rate, which would give you that indication. And then what you want to look at is transit time. So transit time is the time it takes for food to move from your mouth to be exited from the body. And the sweet spot is 16 hours. So the way you're going to do this is to take a teaspoon of white sesame seeds to just cover them in water and to swallow it without um, chewing the sesame seeds. And you're going to note the time of the day. So let's say that you do it at half past three today. And then you're going you're gonna to check when is the first time that those sesame seeds appear in your poop in the toilet. And then you want to measure from that point when you see the last sesame seed. And so that's I, absolutely, be, I absolutely love that Chantal is suggesting that you actually turn around and look <laughs> on the toilet because so few of us do. And it's, important. you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's like talking about sex in the eighties that it's become, it's actually called poop patrol and that people need to know what their poop looks like. We flush too quickly and it is such a big indication of where our health is at. So for at least for this week, we're going to have a check at what our transit time um, is because that will give an indication of gut health. Yes. 
Chantal, just repeat that. Did you say one teaspoon or one tablespoon of white one sesame seeds? One, one teaspoon. One teaspoon of white sesame seeds, <laughs> just covered in enough water and then swallowing it without chewing. Okay, if I'm going to do that. Who else is doing that with me? Okay, good. I don't want to be the only one over the next week. I want to be excited with you guys. <laughs> yeah, so I, I wanted just to, yes. Sorry, um, this is just a general one for next week. I'm not able to attend next week and I'd love to hear the second half. Uh, can it be recorded? Yes. It will be. Sure. Yeah, Philip. Lovely. Thank yeah. you, Stilly. That will be the first cafe that you'll miss. We'll miss I know, it, it will be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank so you, you sesame, sesame seeding with me, Celine. <laughs> yes, Brian. <laughs> Although I must say, my transit time, we, we have constipation in our family. So, um, yeah, our, our weak link is, is definitely the gut. I get it from my mom and, and my dad. And it's incredible when you take the right foods and you fix your fiber. I mean, I now go to the bathroom regularly, which I never knew as a child. Um, thanks, Selena. If, if nobody has any immediate questions, I wanted just to go through a little bit more about the kimchi. So kombucha is fermented tea, which is a natural probiotic. The difference between that and kimchi, because they both fermented, is that with kimchi, because it is vegetables, and the same would go with sauerkraut, that you are getting the probiotics because it's a fermented foodstuff, but you're also getting the prebiotic because the prebiotic is the fiber in the vegetables. So if you for example, take water or milk kefir, you are getting the probiotic, but you are not getting prebiotic. Whereas in kimchi and sauerkraut, you are getting the probiotic and the prebiotic. Chantal, that's the first time I've heard anyone say that. That's genius. And I have a sauerkraut recipe. I will commit to making sauerkraut between now and next week. And if it works, I will share with you how to make it if you haven't that's already. That's absolutely awesome. And um, the other important thing for, for replacing probiotics is the core of an apple. So we all tend to eat around the core and to throw it away, but actually the core of the apple is very, very rich in probiotics. So when that saying came out, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, it's actually an apple core a day that keeps the doctor away. So eating, eating the apple cores and then the, the richest source of micro biome of probiotics is soil, organic soil. That doesn't mean eating tablespoons of soil. It means having a plant box. So if you don't have an outside area to have an organic veggie garden, it means having a box, um, whether it's growing basil or mint or coriander or whatever. And then because it's organic, you would pick the herb and use it directly into your salad or put your mint into your water. And there are traces of soil on that that are very rich in restoring our gut microbiome. So it is not about taking probiotics when we are sick. It is about integrating natural probiotics into our lifestyle, not buying them from the pharmacy in a plastic container, but using fermented foods, using organic vegetables with traces of soil and eating our apple core every day to ensure that the gut microbiome is kept healthy. You've made me feel really good about the fact yeah. that I've always eaten my apple as part of, I've never separated the core. And I used to get so many ribs when I was a kid for eating the pips and everything else. I just ate it. I didn't eat round the core, then eat the core. I just ate the apple and whatever That's fantastic. part of the apple I got. And you've made me feel good about something I just thought was a weird quirk. I also also did that for many years. And then somebody told me that the pips of the apple actually has got one other poison in it. Cyanide. Cyanide. Yeah, that's right. Yes. That so right? that's why it's one apple. It's not a packet of apples. Because if you did, you'll be in the hospital with a stomach pump for cyanide poisoning. So you can eat the apple core, but give the pips to your mother-in-law. <laughs> 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 okay, Joe. Brian, I think those fermented foods are making your brain too smart. <laughs> so I, I'm conscious that um, we usually attend to, we, people are able to leave if you need to. Those of you that want to stay on for a, a five or so more minutes, that, that'll be great. And Sharon, um, to answer your question, I'll find out in the UK for next week where the best fermented food suppliers are. Because mm. Mindful Chef, I don't think sells fermented food they sell recipes that are nice to put together but not yeah, fermented. they deliver organic vegetables don't they yes yes oh. 
Yeah. If you want, Celine, I have got an amazing recipe. It's also good for me time because when I open up my kimchi jar, everybody in the house scatters except me. <laughs> I love kimchi. Yeah, it does. <laughs> And just, just to answer Michelle's question in the comments, a sauerkraut is not made with vinegar, no. 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 It's not. So, so actually, actually, you just start off with, it's one tablespoon of salt, so it should be sea salt. Um, Himalayan salt, we need to be wary of because we're chipping away at a natural resource. But it's a tablespoon of salt into boiled water, and once it's cooled, mm -hmm. you pour it over your vegetables of choice, which are organic. And for example, carrots will ferment within three to four days. So um, that fermented taste, the vinegary taste, is really just the fermentation process of the of the carrots or of the cabbage, um, cabbage in the case of sauerkraut. Yeah. And, and where do you keep the carrots? The shop-bought sauerkraut is okay, because I always thought it was just vinegar they'd put over it. No, so it's, it's been fermented. And, um, you know, the process is about educating the consumer to know what to look for. So nothing ever that's sold in a plastic container. And it's important to read. So when you make your own, you know that you are not, for example, bleaching. Cabbage is a big one where they bleach it. So, so a whole cabbage you'll buy wrapped in glad wrap, but somehow when they shred it, they, they think that it needs to be dipped into a chemical to stop bacteria from growing. And that's exactly what you want for the fermentation process. Firstly, you don't want the chemical. And secondly, you need to have the bacteria on the shredded cabbage in order for it to, to ferment. So making your own is great or asking questions to the supplier in terms of where they get their veggies. Are they organic? Are they using a good form of sea salt? Like you can't use iodized table salt. Um, to to ferment veggies. Okay. And then it needs to it needs to have air. So if you do do that, then you just cover it with, for example, a coffee filter or a muslin cloth. You wouldn't lock it into a tight uh, jar, and the jar always has to be glass, never ceramic because of lead, and never plastic because of the BPAs, and never metal either. So always in a glass container if you do do your own home fermentation. And I'll find us um, um, a good website because I've, I've i know i've got some recent have, have you got any recipes on file chantel because i've got a few for making kimchi and and sauerkraut because i think sauerkraut for me for a beginner is the best place to start i feel like it's so super easy and you get to have fun with your hands mas massaging the cabbage so so literally that simple your ratio is um a liter of boiled cooled water some people use distilled water but if you're filtering your water and it's boiled you put a tablespoon of sea salt pure you let it cool you you shred enough vegetables so you can decide do you want if it's carrots say to chop them in circles or to shred it if it's cabbage you're gonna shred it And then you, you just make, will cover the veg. So it's in the glass container covered by the salt water. And then you leave it for three to five to seven days, um, tasting it intermittently to see whether it's sufficiently fermented. The, the more fermented, the more probiotic, but you also can start to get an alcohol content if you leave it for too long. And you want to always make sure that none of the vegetable is above the water because it'll start yes. to mold. So exactly. You put, so you push it down. Exactly. And as you know, it's really by tasting it, actually. Yes. I know when I was first doing sauerkraut, in the beginning, I didn't like it too strong. Then I put it in the fridge and it stops the fermentation. Right, Chantel? Exactly. But exactly now, right. as you get used to eating more fermented foods, your palate, act, I find that my bacteria crave it. Like the little Yes, that's actually exactly. want it. It's like they want, just like they can crave sugar. But if you get the right guys craving the right stuff, you actually have cravings for this. So then you like it stronger. And then just, just to remember that you are taking the probiotic in order to restore the variety and volume of your gut bacteria. So when we went through that list of all the, what we call the nuclear lifestyle bombs that destroy our gut microbiome, um, 
many of us may have come into the session today thinking it's only medicinal antibiotics that destroy your gut bacteria. But when you realize how many things there are, chronic stress, high intensity exercise, unfiltered tap water, high sugary diets, hydrogenated fat, that we can ill afford to not include fermented foods into our diet all the time. So, so becoming aware of removing as many of those nuclear bombs as possible or reducing them. But for example, if you go out, you're not going to say, oh, I'm not going to have alcohol. I'm not going to have wine. You'll just make sure on that day that you've had a beautiful green leafy veg uh, or a green leafy salad that's had lots of fiber and lots of polyphenols in it. And then you will have bigger margin in terms of destruction of your gut bacteria. It's when we constantly assaulting our gut bacteria without restoring it with natural probiotic foods and feeding it with sufficient prebiotics that we land up with diseases down the line. And, and many people, especially in the medical profession, I don't know what it's like in the UK, but if a doctor qualified before the last three years, unless they specifically studied the gut microbiome. They don't do nutrition. So you are not going to find doctors talking about it. So we spoke about the fact that psychiatrists will refer their patients to a psychologist, but not to a nutritionist or a health coach where the serotonin production is in the gut. If somebody has a dysbiosis of their gut microbiome and leaky gut, they will be experiencing anxiety and depression where yes, they may need an SSRI medication to balance it for a period of time. But if the gut is not balanced, they will find it very difficult to ever become stable on that. And Kelly Brogan is a psychiatrist, America, also leading the world, who um, no longer treats her um, psychiatric patients with medication. She actually does a gut regime with all of them because she recognizes the importance. And she got the autoimmune disease Hashimoto's, and it was through her own experience that it drove her into understanding the gut microbiome and how it's changed, how she works with, um, how she works with her own clients. Thank you, Chantelle. We could stay, yeah, yes. Anna, we could stay all afternoon, but we have lives to lead and we've got sesame seeds to swallow. So, <laughs> <laughs> lovely. Okay, so those of you that can, join us next week. Let's report back on the sesame seeds and invite friends. It's such an important topic. And, Philip, we will record it. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. So Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Cheers, Brian. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Excellent. Thank you. Bye, Thank you. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye, Gemma and Angelique. Bye, guys. Bye. Cheers, my sesame seed buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, it was awesome. Really good. And Brilliant. take pictures of your poo, okay, so we can see the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> That's going too far. That's Photoshop it. <laughs> too much information. <laughs>